Welcome to part four of chapter five. In this part, we'll talk about creating the so-called work breakdown structure or WBS document. So what is a work breakdown structure? A work breakdown structure is a deliverable oriented grouping of the work involved in a project that defines the total scope of the project. To make it simple, a work breakdown structure is a list of specific actions or steps that need to be accomplished in order for you to deliver uh, what's uh, mentioned, what's specified in your scope statement. In other words, a uh, work breakdown structure involves breaking, you down, uh, breaking down your scope statement into small, specific, uh, actionable steps or tasks. And once you complete all those uh, specific tasks, you're done with your entire project. Uh, work breakdown structure is a foundation document that provides the basis for planning and managing project schedules, cost, resources, and changes. So uh, the first thing, uh, the first thing that makes work, uh, work breakdown structure important is that it becomes an important baseline against which you evaluate progress of your entire project. And also some other important documents are derived from a work breakdown structure. Once you specify all the ta all the tasks, all the specific actions, then you can uh, uh, attach those uh, 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 tasks or actions to a timeline. So you have schedule. You can also put some cost estimates to those specific items. And also you can think about resources required to accomplish each of those tasks. So a, a number of other important documents are derived from the so-called work breakdown structure document. Uh, creating a, a work breakdown structure involves doing something called decomposition. It, it, taking a scope and trying to, to break it down into smaller parts. Uh, you keep breaking down your scope into smaller parts until at the lowest level you have the so-called work packages. Now, a work package is a task at the lowest level of the work breakdown structure. Those are specific actionable items. Because uh, some uh, items uh, into which you decompose your scope statement, they may not be actionable. For example, let's say you have this project uh, to improve your organizational performance. Now, that's too high. So under improving organizational performance, you have two subtasks, minimizing cost structure and improving customer satisfaction. But once again, those two items that will help you improve your organizational performance, which is minimizing cost structure and, and improving customer satisfaction, they are not work packages, meaning you cannot act upon them. So you need to break it down, break down those items even further until you have something specific and actionable. Now, there are a couple of ways to do this decomposition. One way is to do a product-oriented decomposition. So let's say uh, the final deliverable of your project is intranet, an internal website uh, that you will use within your organization for internal communication. And this intranet product can be uh, broken down into sub-product, let's say design, because you need to design and provide like a, you know, a visual uh, layout for your intranet uh, page, pages, then homepage design, uh, then design of marketing pages and design of sales pages. So this product is broken down into sub products and within each sub product you have also specific sub steps, writing text, creating, uploading images and fixing hyperlinks. So that's one way to create a work breakdown structure to do the, to do the breakdown or decomposition at the product and sub product level. The other way to create a work breakdown structure is uh, to break down tasks according to the classic phases of a project. So you have a concept phase where you have initial proposal for a concept of, of, a, pro of a project. Then you have um, design phase, then you have development phase, then you have implementation or rollout phase and support phase. So under each of those classic phases in project management, you can add specific actions, specific steps. So that's another way to uh, to approach uh, uh, decomposition of your scope statement for the purposes of creating a work breakdown structure. Now, one note of advice, it's, it's, it's a good idea probably, uh, although it's not a requirement, it's probably a good idea to use Microsoft Project for creating a work breakdown structure because once you create a work breakdown structure using Microsoft Project software, then you can rapidly generate Gantt charts, networking diagrams, and some other documents. So it, it, it may actually save you some time. To, if you decide to implement your work breakdown structure in Microsoft Project, although it is not a formal requirement. And uh, all, all of you can get access to Microsoft Project software by using that uh, Microsoft Imagine account. If you go to the handout section in Canvas, you will see some instructions on how to get access to that software for free so that you can have Microsoft Project for one semester or one year. I don't remember exactly the licensing term for free. So yeah, once you create a work breakdown structure, uh, you can um, you can quickly create other documents like schedules, Gantt charts, networking diagrams. 
Uh, some other approaches when it comes to creating work breakdown structure. Uh, some organizations, they have specific guidelines on how work breakdown structure has to be uh, uh, created, but uh, most organization-specific approaches, they fall into those areas. First of all, you have the analogy approach. Uh, what you can do, you can review work breakdown structures of similar projects that were done in the past, and then you just uh, tailor those work breakdown structure to your own project. Then you have the so-called top-down approach where you start with the largest item with the overall goal with your scope statement and then you keep breaking it down into smaller parts until you have those work packages. And then you have the so-called bottom-up approach. Uh, some people are not good when it comes to thinking at that high strategic level, so they like to think about specific things. So you may start thinking about specific steps that you need to implement uh, to accomplish your, um, your scope statement, to, to, uh, to deliver on your scope statement, but then you can organize those small specific items into more general categories. Or sometimes you use a mind mapping approach. It's like a creative approach where you start with this overall idea, then you have branches. So, so let's say you have this IT upgrade project and you, you will say, well, as a part of this project, we need to do, we need to upgrade inventory, acquire hardware and software, install hardware and software. And then for each task that you come up, you, you create additional branches or leaves with an additional task. So it's like an organic way of thinking about what needs to be done. Um, now, uh, oftentimes when you create a work, a bro a work breakdown structure, uh, the linguistic labels that you use for each of the tasks may not be clear enough for people to really understand what you mean by a particular task. So that's why it's a good practice to create the so-called work breakdown structure dictionary. It's a document that describes detailed information about each work breakdown structure item. Um, and it becomes an important baseline as well, because here in, in your work breakdown structure uh, dictionary, uh, you have uh, you know very detailed description of the items contained in the work breakdown structure. And if you combine it with a scope statement, then you have your project definition that will also be a baseline against which you will compare the progress of the project. Uh, some advice, uh, some general best practices when it comes to creating work breakdown structures and uh, work breakdown uh, structured dictionaries. First of all, a unit of work should appear at only one place in the work breakdown structure. If you duplicate work in different areas of your work breakdown structure, then you're wasting resources and there can be a conflict because you're gonna have different people doing the same task in different ways using different approaches and technologies. So you're gonna be wasting uh, resources and creating confusion. Uh, the work content of a work breakdown stru structure item is the sum of all the work breakdown structure items below it. So what this means, it means that if you have uh, an arrangement like this, then those three items, they completely describe this item. In other words, those, once you, uh, once you uh, deliver those three products or once you go through those three steps, it means you also accomplish or deliver this step. You don't have anything missing here. So those items under this more general item, they're, ex they're uh, mutually exclusive, meaning they're different, distinct, and they're collectively exhaustive. In other words, collectively, they describe this entire higher order step. That's what it's meant by this principle. Um, uh, a work breakdown uh, structure item has to be the responsibility of one individual. It's okay to have a group of people working on a particular item, but at the end of the day, uh, one person has to be responsible for it. It has to do with accountability. You need to have a person who at the end of the day can be accountable for a particular tax, task. So you can always go to this person and you can ask him or her, you know, why you didn't deliver that item or when this item will be delivered. So it's important to have somebody in charge. If you don't have anybody in charge of a specific work breakdown structure item, then nothing may ever get done. Also, your work breakdown structure must be consistent with the way in which work is actually going to be performed. In other words, it needs to be realistic. It, it needs to serve the project team first and other purposes uh, second. In other words, it needs to be aligned with the way real life works because sometimes you create plans that seem to be too unrealistic. That's not how real life works. Uh, this, is not how pe this is not how people do things in real life. So you need to be mindful of, of that. And one way to make it realistic is to get project team members involved because the people who are doing uh, the actual work they're in a good position to, to, to give you feedback, uh, first of all, on what needs to be done and also on, on how it should be done, you know, how things are done in this particular industry, in this particular organization, or using those particular technologies. Uh, each work breakdown structure item ideally should be documented in a work breakdown structure dictionary to ensure accurate understanding of the scope of work by everybody. 
And then your work breakdown structure needs to be a flexible tool, meaning it needs to be able to accommodate the change. So, uh, you know, you need to keep track of your work breakdown structure items in a way where you can update them and you can keep track what was updated, when was updated, so that, so that you don't get lost in different versions of your work breakdown structure. Now here you have some, uh, some uh, cases when scope was not properly managed and how uh, not properly managing your scope led to serious organizational problems. Here you have a classic case of a Texas-based uh, uh, drug company called Fox Meyer. I think they were involved in uh, logistics. You know, they were responsible for uh, pharmaceutical logistics. It's a classic case of a project failure. Um, you know, this company, uh, what they were trying to do, they were trying to implement an ERP system, I believe it was SAP, but the project was so big, they were trying to revamp everything, the entire organization, uh, you know, they, are trying to, they were trying to put every, pro every process on the rails of this new ERP system, and that turned out uh, to be so complex, the scope of this project was so large, it created so many complexities, it required so many resources, uh, it created so much disruption to existing processes, existing work, so the entire company went bankrupt. And I remember after that, they actually sued their consultant, I think it was Arthur Anderson, one of those big IT slash accounting consulting uh, houses that was responsible for this ERP project. So they sued them for like half a billion dollars because they blamed them for the bankruptcy, for the, for the bankruptcy of the entire organization. And then in 2001, McDonald's, uh, they tried to initiate a project to create an intranet that would connect its headquarters with all of its restaurants to provide detailed operational information in real time. Well, after spending $170 million on consultants and in initial implementation planning, they realized that the project was too big. Maybe it's, it's realizable nowadays, but probably in 2001, uh, internet, intranet projects were still very new was very expensive and technology was still emerging so that's why they, they thought that the project was too complex. I think one thing that you can see is that one solution to those potential solutions to those failures is to do things on a small scale first right don't try to implement ERP across the entire organization try to implement it in a small department department first or try to implement a small module let's say financial module first before you roll out the entire ERP system and similar here maybe McDonald's could have tried implementing that intranet for one city or one state and then uh, once they implement that, once they learn from their mistakes, they can roll, roll out the system uh, to other, other locations, other branches. So starting small is a good solution to, uh, to scope creep, to the situation where scope just gets out of control and the entire project fails, sometimes resulting uh, serious organizational problems, including bankruptcy of the entire organization, something that happened with Fox Meyer. Well, uh, this concludes uh, part four of chapter five. Thank you for watching.